This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. Let us pray. Risen Lord Jesus, be made known to us in the breaking of bread and now in your word broken open to the power of your Holy Spirit and in your name and to the Father's glory we pray. Amen. It's great to be together this morning as we continue to celebrate our risen Lord's witness in the midst of his people, not just historically among the disciples and those that would follow him with us here now as his Holy Spirit continues to be poured out, calling us to new life in his name. We are all witnesses, always and everywhere, of his glory. There's an Episcopal church in Valley Forge, and there the story is told that during the second battle of Bull Run, during the Civil War, a young captain named Robert Clark and his men were surrounded by Confederate forces but they refused to surrender. In the battle that ensued, Clark's entire detachment was overrun, listed as missing. In action, Clark was presumed dead. When his family was notified, they sent a telegram asking for the return of his body. But Captain Clark was not dead. Separated from his detachment, Clark had hidden behind enemy lines for three days, and although wounded and hungry, he was able to make his way back to his headquarters in time to deal with his family's request. He sent the following telegram. Still have use for the body. We'll bring it back in person. Your loving son, Robert. <laughs> In our gospel lesson, it is Easter evening, and the risen Jesus appears in the midst of the disciples. The ascension, which is one of our core doctrines as Christians, will occur 40 days later, when Jesus' body will be taken up to heaven, fully glorified, and transformed even more, a sign of what will happen to us one day. But for now, Jesus still has use for his body. His resurrected body is essentially a bridge between our mortal existence and the glorification that he experiences in the ascension. It's the in-between time. And let us see how this speaks to us as we hold out for resurrection and hope as mortal beings called to immortality in his name. We heard from Luke this morning in our Gospel reading, and Luke was a physician. He knew all about bodies and their limits. And so it was crucial for Luke to make his point as strongly as possible that Jesus had risen from the dead and was alive in flesh and bone, and he was even hungry. When we study the concept of resurrection, we find that the writers of the New Testament, while acknowledging deep mystery, remain adamant about resurrection being spiritual as well as highly physical. This notion that there's a detachment from the physical and the spiritual, which is a very Greek mindset, historically, is not the Hebrew mindset. The Hebrew mindset sees a unity between the physical and the spiritual. And the writers of the New Testament, as those pages turn, spell this out for us, even in the mystery. Regarding the mystery of resurrection, the Apostle Paul wrote, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye. And the spiritual dimension of resurrection is captured beautifully by the Apostle John in this morning's epistle. What we will be has not yet been revealed. 
What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. Notice that resurrection is all about Jesus. And how we are brought into his love eternally. Having heard these two scriptures, at the same time, let's not miss the highly physical dimension of resurrection as well. And hear from St. Paul again. The dead will be raised imperishable. That means our bodies will be raised into newness of life. What does this mean for us? These esoteric concepts? <clears throat> The Bible tells us in all of this that God will one day give us new bodies. Bodies that no longer hurt. Bodies that no longer suffer from disease or decay. They will still be our own, yet not bound by the same limits of our mortality. They will be similar to Jesus' glorified body. The message for us this morning is that even with our imperfections and limits, God still has use for our bodies today and into eternity. There's a pastor by the name of Stephen Montgomery who tells of an article that came out entitled, Now That I Have Cancer, It's Touching Time. This article was written by a fellow minister who was diagnosed with cancer who noticed that suddenly there seemed to be permission for people to reach out and touch him. He said, it's funny that a broken body should somehow be more touchable than one that's whole. Lifelong friends with whom he had only shaken hands were now hugging him and embracing him. He made the point that in all the Bible, there is only one story about someone touching Jesus face to face while he was alive. Now there was a woman who touched his garment, and he said, who touched me? And there was a woman who washed his feet with her hair. But the one time someone reached out to touch Jesus face to face, think about this, was to betray him with a kiss. Maybe that's why all these resurrection appearances include touching, this minister wondered. It's only after the breaking time of crucifixion that resurrection, the touching time, if you will, comes. In the upper room, the disciples now touch Jesus face to face. We see the redemption of the touch in this family. He concludes the article, we seem able to touch one another in our brokenness in ways that we never can in wholeness God likes to use broken things. Broken flasks, broken bread, broken bodies, even relationships that have been broken with a kiss. My body and spirit have been broken by cancer, he writes. That means it's okay to touch me. I'm thankful. Let's let that sink in for a How have we been broken, betrayed, wounded, hurt? And how might God want to surround you with his presence through the body of Christ to embrace you? How might we embrace one another with a newfound depth and power through the risen Lord's touch among us? Touch me and see says Jesus, calling his disciples to get in touch with the physical scars and the bodily pain of the human condition. Hear 
Jesus meets us in our physical frailty and pain, knowing all too well our woundedness, yet he calls us to the hope of something more, much more. Notice how Jesus spent Easter. Eating. And with touching. Pointing the disciples not to an empty tomb, but to another dimension. Resurrected life. As much as it is a future hope, it begins now. It's happening. May God raise us up. We touched briefly upon the ascension at the beginning of this message. Now we'll touch briefly upon the incarnation, another core doctrine of the Christian faith. The heart of the incarnation God becoming one of us, that's what it means, is the redemption of our physicality. God, once again, calling creation good. A reflection of this is the resurrected Jesus inviting his followers back to the physicality of the shared meal. Have you anything to eat, he asks. That might seem to be an odd thing for him to say in this moment. Yet notice how it connects to the sacred meal, which is at the heart of incarnational living as Christians. Central to our weekly worship is that sacred supper Jesus provided for his followers in the upper room on the night before he was betrayed with that kiss from Judas. Sitting with the disciples, Jesus took the Passover bread, blessed and broken, then shared it with his friends. In words that have become our family story, Jesus identified himself with the bread as his body and to the shared cup as the new covenant in his blood poured out for our sins, that we might walk in forgiveness and newness of life. Each time we gather around that table, something's happening, something that's pointing us to that new dimension, resurrected life. This great act is not only a defining memory for us, but it is the way we personally experience the risen Christ where physicality, God's and our own, connects us to a future feast we will one day celebrate with glorified bodies. This is no doubt what St. Paul envisioned as he wrote in his second letter to the Corinthians, we who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image. That means that each time you kneel at that rail and you look across the rail, at your fellow Christians, at me, at the body of Christ, your face is unveiled. You're seeing God's glory through God's people, and you and I are being transformed in the midst of that sacred communion. Our physicality matters. Who you are, what you look like, the life you've lived, it matters. It's precious to God, and it's precious to us as the family of God. Here at St. Paul's, we gently and lovingly enfold one another at that table. We're all are welcome each time we gather to break bread. Here we contemplate the Lord's glory as we share our physicality and experience Christ in one another. So if there's one thing we should leave with here today, it's this. God still has use for these bodies of ours. Bodies that will one day be resurrected and are even in the process of transformation now. So what can we do? Let us glorify God with our bodies. Let us present our bodies as living sacrifices acceptable to the Lord. Let us see our bodies as holy vessels, conduits of God's love and God's presence. 
and the love of Jesus touching the world. As we come to the rail this morning, as the body of Christ, may we know the Savior's touch face to face through resurrection hope. May we pray. Lord Jesus, we believe that you are in our midst through the power of your Holy Spirit, calling us to new life, calling us to resurrection hope. You choose to meet us where we are in our physicality and our full humanity, and you call us to share in your divinity. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, touch us by your grace. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.